next up we have Kelly Demelor. Demero, right? Demero. Oh, darn. And she's going to talk, well, she's with the Secular Coalition of America. Uh, if you guys have been coming, anybody here, I mean, many of you have been coming for the past few years. Uh, you know that we had Gloria Linda Brown, who was an executive director of secular.org, and then we had Sean Faircloth, and last year we actually had a sub in, and now she kind of does that work for secular. So here she is. She's going to talk a little bit about who she is, and then going to give you her spiel about being secular in America, which is a fun thing. <laughs> it's really fun. We have. Thank you for the enthused introduction. So, hi everyone, I'm Kelly. I used to teach, so I love getting back the feedback of, hi, welcome. Um, right off the top, uh, you might have read that this is two and a half hours. Um, I could go for two and a half hours about the Constitution, but um, I don't want to put everyone to sleep. So, uh, we're going to keep it to an hour. Just make sure you can get to all the other awesome events that you want to hear about. Uh, and give you a nice little tight package of uh, constitutional First Amendment knowledge. So a little bit about me. I'm the research and advocacy manager from the Secular Coalition for America. And uh, woo! Woo! thank you. Uh, before that, um, way, way back I, in college, I studied to become a teacher. And I taught kindergarten and um, nobody doesn't like a teacher, especially a kindergarten teacher, and uh, I felt loved by the community and that was wonderful, but I saw the system wasn't really working as I wanted it to. I taught in Florida. So I decided to go to law school. Um, and people don't like lawyers as much as they like kindergarten teachers. <laughs> um, and. That has been the trend ever since, because um, I said, not only am I going to be a lawyer, but I'm going to be a lobbyist. And I'm going to be a lobbyist for non-theists, and it's something I'm passionate and excited about, but um, it definitely turns some heads and squints some eyes uh, more than I work with five-year-olds. Um, but it can sometimes feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you all very much for uh, coming in here today. I'm going to be talking about the truth about religious liberty. Um, the alternate titles, Ignorance Becomes Intolerance, because there's a lot of misinformation about what your religious liberty rights are, and they're being used to portray people as victims who aren't really victims, and therefore limit, they think they have the right to limit others' religious freedom, or freedom to not have religion in their lives. Um, and so that's going to be what I'm discussing. Uh, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, who we are, in case you're not familiar with the Secular Coalition for America. Um, our mission is to increase the visibility of and respect for non-theistic viewpoints in the United States, and also to protect and strengthen the secular character of our government, because we really believe that that's the best guarantee of freedom for all. Uh, we are made up of 11 member organizations Many uh, members of these organizations, I better in the room right now. So, uh, can I get a holler if you're a member of any of these organizations? Woo! All right. Um, after law school, I got into the secular movement by being a legal intern at the American Humanist Association, um, which was just an amazing experience and really got me fired up about secular issues and religion and government. Uh, so these are our 11 member organizations, but we also have endorsing organizations and they are growing as rapidly as people who don't identify with a religion are growing. Uh, in May we had 34, in August we, um, right now we have 60 and we're shooting for 100 by December and we really think we're going to hit that because there's, as, as the word's getting out about what we do and what we support, uh, we're finding that over 50% of Americans support the separation of religion and government. Some of the, um, we cover a whole range of issues in health and safety and education, uh, but some of the like hot topics that have been in the news recently that uh, you may be more familiar with are the HHS contraception mandate, uh, faith healing exemptions in child abuse laws, which uh, exempts parents from being charged with child abuse if their child was gravely ill and they tried to heal them with prayer and it did not work. 
um, they're exempted from being charged. Also, the multiple issues of religion in public schools. Uh, public schools are taxpayer funded, and as such, any endorsement of religion in the schools is an endorsement of religion by the government. Uh, marriage license discrimination. With civil marriage, uh, the definition of who the government gives a marriage license to should not be based on religious dogma, if the government's going to be in the business of giving marriage licenses. And then something that uh, is not so strong and um, divisive of an issue, but is just as important, is uh, tax subsidies for religious organizations. Uh, many people don't realize how many exemptions religious organizations receive from having to pay taxes. But a study done by the Center for Inquiry found that in just one year, the amount of subsidies that the government uh, gives to tax organizations or the exemptions that the religious organizations don't have to pay, in one year totals uh, 71 billion, billion with a B, dollars in one year. Um, it's a huge number, but it's kind of hard to wrap your head around a number that big. So when I went to try to put it into context of what that meant to me, and again with my education background, uh, that's what I thought of. Uh, what else could we do with $71 billion? Well, we could buy 6,000 brand new elementary schools. Uh, that's 10 times the amount of elementary schools in West Virginia or Missouri, which are uh, consistently on the bottom of the list for best education in the country. Uh, we could double the number of schools in the country in 11 years, have twice as many schools, uh, which means you'd have half the class size. Um, but it's not just these 6,000 brand new elementary schools. You have to have teachers in them. Uh, but this $71 billion covers the elementary schools and 300,000 new teachers. If we spent all the $71 billion on teachers alone, um, it would double the number of elementary school teachers in the United States in one year. Okay, so we have the teachers, but we also have the students. Um, we can cover school supplies for six million students. And we can provide transportation for all six million students to get to school. And there'd be three billion left over for a nuclear submarine. <laughs> So we have to really think about where we want our in, uh, incentives of tax exemptions and subsidies to be going. Uh, and I'd rather them be going to these schools. And a sub. Some other issues that the Secular Coalition deals with that, um, like taxes, are just, they're not as um, divisive and, and don't really get the, the news cycle coverage are what we call government action. So national ceremonies and symbols that endorse religion, uh, for example, In God We Trust being our national motto, and our national day of prayer, and having under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, and then also government officials promoting religion, uh, opening legislative sessions with a prayer, or having So Help Me God at the end of an oath. Um, these kind of actions make people who are non-theistic feel like they're bad Americans, or they're not patriotic, if they don't want to say the national motto because it endorses something that they don't believe in religiously. And they're actions of the government, and it's right there in the very first amendment to our Constitution that Congress shall make no law uh, establishing a religion. And when they're saying they have inscribed on the wall or uh, in our laws that God is our not national motto, that's establishing a religion. President Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address that we're a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So when a government official, acting in their official capacity, uh, prays or endorses God or Jesus Christ, they're not John Smith endorsing God. When they're acting in their official capacity, they are the government. They are, we are a government of people, and when they act in that capacity, they're acting as the government, so they are the government endorsing. Um, God or Jesus Christ. So we have to be very careful and um, we have to really make sure we stand up and do something about this because it, it seems, uh, I, heard, I hear a lot, there are uh, more dangerous 
detrimental things happening. There are uh, children whose health and lives are put at risk because of, of faith healing and medical neglect and those issues. Um, but we sh And those are important, and we do have to have them at the forefront, but we can't ignore these kinds of uh, government endorsements. We can't just let them slide by because they're building blocks, and they add up to create this base of misinformation that is then used uh, to support far more dangerous actions uh, when they can point back to, oh, our national motto and our day of prayer, and when they can say things like, well, that's the way it's always been. Well, that's not true. I don't know if you've heard this uh, recently, but there's a lot of debate over whether we were founded as a Christian nation. Uh, a lot of research I've done uh, on this personally, uh, the benefit of living in DC is I was able to go right to the Library of Congress and go right to the archives and open up the books. And I was ready to point out every instance where this was totally wrong, 100% um, off the mark. Um, and it's a little upsetting to say that it's not 100% off the mark, that our founding fathers were individuals. And they did have their own varying views of religion in their own personal lives. But to me, that just strengthens the argument that when they were acting in their official capacity and when they wrote the Constitution, there's no reference to God in the Constitution except to say religion cannot be endorsed by the government or there cannot be an oath of op or um, a religious test to be um, to hold office. And they have the oath of office for the president in the Constitution, and it does not end with so help me God because there is no so help me God in the Constitution. A lot of people point to the Declaration of Independence and a couple instances in there where they say, you're of our Lord or creator. I want to point out first that the Declaration of Independence uh, is a very important historical document, but it's not the laws of our land. The Constitution is the basis of our laws. The Declaration of Independence was a declaration of war. Uh, and while it does have these references, it They've been shown to be very uh, deistic. So the idea that they're Christian uh, is just not true. They're um, not Christian in a belief of Jesus Christ. They're uh, deistic in the belief of um, uh, naturalism and having a, uh, a God that no longer is involved um, in day-to-day -day life. But again, that when they got to writing the First Amendment, the fact that they put in language that made sure that even their own personal religions that they may have held were not involved in government, that just speaks more to me than when they had their own personal religions and they did not want that to interfere. Um, so back to the, the ceremonies and symbols and why that's dangerous is in a similar way that um, like junk science, you have this junk history that authors you may have heard of like David Barton are referring to. and then you have senators and legislators and government officials like Huckabee then pointing to David Barton saying, well, he's a historian. And so we can build from that. If we don't go back to the sources and say, look at these sources, that's not what they said at all, then it makes it a lot harder to counter their arguments um, at the end. It's also important to get on this sooner than later because the longer we let um, these kind of references go, the more they're just accepted as truth. And I like to think of it as uh, product placement. So when we have these subtle mentioning of God in our society, it's very similar to uh, the mentioning of different brands and um, endorsements of products that you should purchase. Because we put our, our faith and our trust in these individuals to tell us you know, what the best thing and right thing is to do. And when they're putting out belief in God as the right thing to do from the point of view of a government official, uh, people aren't going to remember back to a time when that wasn't the case.
So I want to just put out an example of the longer we let these go, the more they're going to be considered truth. Do you remember when it was absurd to pay $5 for a cup of coffee? I don't, uh, and neither will the next generation, because that's all that I've known is Starbucks on every corner and coffee being $5. And um, it, if you were a graduate before 1954, you don't remember that there wasn't under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, if you, um, again, were from that um, time period, you, or later, you don't remember there not being a national day of prayer that was added again in, in the 50s and in 56, that's when In God We Trust became our motto. Not 1776, not 1781, 1956, uh, 60 years ago. So you'll also notice that that kind of coincides with the Red Scare. And that's really where a lot of these references came from. Um, that was it happened during the Civil War as well. That's when uh, we got references to God started appearing on our, our money. Um, but the scary thing about the, this happening in the 50s is that it wasn't from our legislators. Um, the same people who are telling us that we were always a Christian nation um, are the people for whom that seems to benefit. So the Knights of Columbus is a Catholic fraternal organization, and they're very proud of the fact that they are the ones who got under God put in our Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, you might know, you might know this guy. Um, the National Day of Prayer was a result of uh, Billy Graham and just his push and influence uh, on legislators to make this happen. So this idea that you can't be a good American without a belief in God, I don't know. Um, who's been watching the Republican National Convention, but um, Marco Rubio's speech, which is, oh, I, I'm from Florida, and it's just like, come on, man, you're, you're representing me, and then you're up there saying, if you don't believe in God, then basically you're not an American. That was, that was tough to watch. Um, that was, that was my, that's my representative, that's my legislator, and uh, for him to say that I'm not American if I don't believe in God. That's, uh, that's not fair. So we need to make sure we're actively working against these uh, things and against, and that we know where these misrepresentations and sometimes lies are coming from. Um, one big group that is pushing really hard to get uh, these lies to be accepted as truth is the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. It's tough because I feel like we're always picking on uh, these guys, but they, man, did they ask for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is their leader, Cardinal Timothy Dolan. <laughs> um, they had their annual meeting right here in Atlanta in June, and this concept that they're pushing of, of what religious liberty is, where they're trying to redefine it, was at the forefront of this conference. And one of their main speakers was the president of Catholic University, John Garvey, uh, and he said this, that saving religious liberty means reminding people to love God. He really doesn't understand the idea of liberty, liberty, freedom to choose. Um, freedom to choose to believe whatever you want or freedom to choose not to believe. Uh, these are, he needs to open a history book. These are, it, our Supreme Court presidents say that we have the right to believe or not believe in anything we want. Um, but you know, they're working on their policy goals and their goal is to get God back in the front of the conversation. And if that means telling uh, Catholics that their victims, that their rights are under attack, that's the strategy they're going to take. Uh, they planned this uh, long, this two-week event uh, that ended on the 4th of July called the Fortnight for Freedom. And during this event, they cited what they found is their most concrete examples of attacks on religious liberty. Uh, this include, included pulling licenses from discriminatory um, adoption agencies and canceling a government contract with a Catholic charity uh, that was to provide services to sex trafficking victims um, and then as well they referenced the HHA's contraception mandate. In all of these cases it was the government reaching out to try to work with 
a religious organization um, and saying, when you work with the government, you must operate in a secular manner. And they would not choose to do that. Uh, they said it was a violation of their religious freedom if they weren't allowed to use government-given money however they wanted to. If you, the freedom is you don't have to take that money. <laughs> if you believe that this is what you want to do, do it. Don't take that money. Um, but of course, they, they filed a lawsuit, and they lost, because um, they're on the wrong side of the law on this one. So the truth about religious liberty, what is it really? Um, well, it's not absolute. You have the right to believe whatever you want to believe. You do not have the right to act on those beliefs. Um, our country has forever held that laws are allowed to limit religious liberty. And um, even one of my personally less favorite justices, Justice Scalia, uh, <laughs> he no he even he noted that if religious belief was allowed to trump law, then every citizen would be a law unto themselves. And uh, so all citizens have to comply with um, the legal term is laws of uh, neutral laws of general applicability. So if it's a law that is not targeted at religion, but has an incidental effect on a way you practice your religion, everyone has to comply with this law. Uh, occasionally they'll make accommodations because religious liberty is a balancing act. We have these two important religious clauses. There is the free exercise clause, but there's also the establishment clause. And at no point is the government by the Constitution ever required to accommodate religion. If you're told that my free exercise right means that the government has to accommodate me, you're wrong. They never have to accommodate you. But sometimes they choose to do so, and that they are allowed to do. However, when an accommodation becomes so, for uh, a religious practice becomes so strong, it then becomes the government establishing a religion. So we have to find this balance. Um, the Supreme Court describes it as play in the joints. You have to find where you're not inhibiting people's free exercise rights, but you're not doing so in a manner that the government is now establishing. Uh, they can't establish a um, particular practice. They can't establish a particular belief. Uh, they can't even establish religion over non-religion. So it's, it's a tricky balance to find, but um, it's been tilted um, in the direction pretty much of government actions applying to all citizens. And so this idea that there's currently, uh, the government's a waging a war on religion. In the past uh, 10 to 15 years, free exercise rights have been expanded. If we're going one way or another, we're not definitely not limiting free exercise rights. In the 1990s, there was a law passed called um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, and uh, this law put a higher standard on when the government passes a law that restricts uh, free exercise. If it puts a substantial burden on someone's free exercise, the government has to then prove that they have a compelling reason for that law. So it made uh, extra hoops that the government has to jump through to make sure that they're not putting a substantial burden on free exercise rights. So this is the way that it's moving, because before that, um, since the 1940s, there had been only two situations where someone's free exercise rights had trumped the law, uh, and that was compulsory education, making kids go to school, um, and unemployment benefits. There are real threats to religious liberty, but the threat uh, is that people don't understand that liberty is the freedom to choose. The real threat is when accommodations for one individual infringe on the liberty of another. So in the case of the contraception mandate, by giving uh, employers who are just secular employers, part of uh, the national community, or even if they're just affiliated with a religious organization where it's not the goal of that organization to promote their religion, by allowing them to push their religious views onto their employees, you're limiting the religious rights of the employee. And I don't think that was a big enough part of the discussion um, 
or our counter arguments to you know, the argument that, oh, you're limiting the religious rights of these employers. What about the employees? They have religious rights too. And by denying them something that is um, vital to their health care and life so that um, you're, you're denying them their choice to participate in their religious beliefs and act on them as they want to. And then finally, just because it says it's religious liberty doesn't actually mean it's religious liberty. Uh, there's an amendment that's on the ballot in Florida, and it's Amendment 8. And it was originally titled the Religious Freedom Amendment. This amendment wants to remove the language from the Florida Constitution that says uh, the government cannot fund religious organizations and replace it with uh, a brilliantly evil use of the word discrimination to say the government cannot discriminate by, against religious organizations by not providing them funding. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's terrible, but sometimes you just have to be like, I see what you did there. <laughs> Good work. Well played, yeah. Um, but this, this is not just going to be, well, a violation of the U.S. Constitution, and it's not just going to be terrible because taxpayer money is going to go directly to uh, the promotion of religious beliefs, but I don't think the religious organizations know what they're getting into, and some have actually joined the different um, vote no on Amendment 8 organizations because they realize that it really is a, a two-way protection. We're trying to protect um, the government from having religious involvement, and they're trying to protect the religious organizations from having the government involved with them. If Once you're getting funding, they can regulate you. They can come and look through your books, and they can start to tell you what you can and can't do because you're getting money. Um, so just because it acts like liberty, or it's titled liberty, or freedom, or discrimination, you really have to read these uh, amendments that are they're happening all over. You have to read them a lot closer to make sure um, they're not just doing some tricky language to some buzzwords that people feel strongly about uh, when you're really signing up for, for more than you want. So at the Secular Coalition, we're, we're trying to figure out how can we make sure that legislators know the truth, know what religious liberty really is and what it isn't. So some of the actions we're taking, we're putting together a uh, model secular policy guide to hand out to legislators to let them know, here's the background, here's the precedent, here's what you can uh, and can't do, and here's what is not uh, prohibited. And we're going to also host Hill briefings where we talk to them about um, what religious liberty is. And we're definitely working with both sides. Uh, we sent representatives to the Republican and the Democratic conventions. We've got liaisons in both parties um, on all levels. And one of our mottos is that secular values are American values. And we really, really believe that, that the idea of a secular government is something that is the best guarantee of freedom for everyone. It protects everybody, religious, non-religious, whatever party you're in. Um, having a secular government is your best guarantee of freedom. So we work with, um, with both parties, we're nonpartisan. But we're, so we're working in Capitol Hill, and we're in DC, and we're working on a federal level. But I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of the most egregious things that are happening are happening on the state level. Um, there's a lot of scary stuff going on. Um, some examples I have, six states have laws that allow pharmacists to refuse to fill emergency prescriptions for contraceptives. 21 states offer exemptions from contraceptive coverage for employers. 44 states have laws that require school classes to recite the pledge under, with under God. Um, only 18 states require sex education curricula to be medically accurate. <laughs> yeah. um, and so we're, we're seeing this happening, and we're in D.C., and we're like, well, we, we have to fight this. What can we do? So some of the things we're doing to um, help you talk to your legislators and make sure 
um, that everyone's informed about this is we're, we're having a national lobby day and policy conference. We uh, do this every year. It's been a huge success and we're just expanding it. We're trying to um, provide training because so many people have the passion and the knowledge and um, they might not feel comfortable talking to legislators or, okay, I, I know I want to do something about this, but how do I do it? This training we have every year, um, usually in the fall, is a great way to get a little information on the best way to present this message so that it will be received. And it's also, um, we do lobbying. We march up to Capitol Hill and we meet with the legislators from your state and we actively talk to them and we say, hey, look, we're here. We're uh, constituents. We're normal. Um, we have concerns. Let's talk. And it helps to show a lot of the legislators who might think that uh, this constituency, no matter what way you slice it, if you say secular Americans, it's 55%. If you say people who uh, don't have a religious affiliation, uh, known as nuns, it's almost 20%. Uh, one out of every five Americans, religion, not that big a deal. Um, but yet the message that the, you know that's out there is that religion is so important and we're a religious country and the more we show them, hey, um, can we hmm, tone that down, cut that out, please? Um, there's a lot of us and you're getting on my nerves. Uh, can help to, to just get in the office and show them that maybe what you think the makeup of America is is not quite accurate. Um, and then we also have our national secular calendar on our website that just has a list of events going on across the country. Uh, if you want to get more involved to participate, we, we have presidential and congressional scorecards, um, important voter education uh, information so you know what your uh, legislators are doing. And we're going to be coming out in just a few weeks with our most recent updated presidential scorecard for this election. Then we're also forming state chapters around the country. Um, and this is uh, part of my job, and it's the absolute best part of it, because I get to talk to people in every state about things that matter, things that are a part of your daily life um, that are really affecting you. And those are the things that are, are really important and that get people uh, involved and passionate and motivated, because we just want to live our lives. And I mean, I think that's part of, that's definitely part of what got me involved is I just want to, to do my own thing without you telling me what I need to believe. And people are getting more and more involved as they're being pressed on more and more told what they're supposed to believe. So we're starting these state chapters and um, we've got different phases that we're rolling them out in. We've already had the, um, the first conference calls for about 30 states. Um, so we are in phase three. So far, we've had uh, conference calls for all these states. There are approximately 10 per year. And the first one goes about an hour, but after that, they're about 20 minutes long. And uh, people from that state call in, and we discuss what's happening. Um, what do we need to move on? We have some great state legislation tracking software, so we can be on top of these uh, bills and know when these committee hearings are happening. and get involved and um, get the, all the different organizations that are at state level talking to each other, working with each other, and uh, really kind of come together and come up with a plan of action. What are we going to do? And um, so far it's been uh, really a really great process and we have already have uh, three states that are um, up and running and they have some leadership and uh, I really encourage everyone to call in to your state's conference call. And if you're wondering where that is, we have a lot of information on our website, secular.org. There's also um, flyers on the tables in the back that list when the calls in September are. And you can find your state, call in, uh, and we can talk about you know, what you want to do. Or you can just listen in just so you can stay updated on what's happening. We do hope we're going to have a conference call for every single state and D.C. and Puerto Rico by the end of this year. Um, we hope to have uh, about 20 chapters set up. Uh, running on their own by the end of the year. So we have um, we have the Secular Coalition for America, but we are f definitely fighting a very big battle against other lobbying organizations uh, in DC. One you may have heard of, uh, Focus on the Family, they're teaching 
people um, these misinterpretations, um, if we want to be kind about it, and telling them that they need to get active and they need to call their legislator. Um, so we really need to, to motivate our base and get our people up and calling their legislator and getting involved so um, they don't believe that this is the only view of America, that there are people who want um, the government to be secular. And we're, we have the passion, um, but they have a little more of something else. Uh, a recent Pew Research study found that lobbying, religious lobbying groups in D.C., um, the Secular Coalition spent 3% of what the fo focus on the family spent, and that is for one year. Uh, they spend 31 times more than we do uh, so that they can fulfill their mission, um, which is family advocacy organization is what they are, and they try to inspire men and women to live out biblical citizenship. They are one of eight organizations that spend more than $10 million a year. Um, none of those eight organizations are secular uh, because we are the only 501c4 secular lobbying organization. So some uh, places you can get some more information if you want to get more involved. Uh, we have a national conference call every Thursday at noon. Um, we know a lot of people have a lot going on in their lives, and it is um, on a weekday, but we try to keep it around lunch, and we try to keep it to 20 minutes, and it just goes through tons of information about what's happening uh, on Capitol Hill, what the president's up to, court cases we need to know about, um, just lots of what's happening with the state chapters, and just it's a good overview of, of where where we're at on on the policy side of things. Uh, we have our blog, which is on our uh, website, uh, Facebook. We have the Secular Coalition for America Facebook, and the uh, state Facebook pages are up and coming as they have their first conference call, so about 30 of them are up so far. We have uh, a Twitter account and we send out action alerts. So if you go to our website and sign up to receive our action alerts, you'll know uh, we can, you put in your zip code and that way we know if something's happening specifically in your state, you'll get an email about it and know what's happening. Uh, and then we have our website which just has a lot of these great resources that uh, you can go and get informed. We're in the process of updating, especially the issues section um, to try to keep it, um, make it a little easier to find the information you're actually looking for because we, there's so much happening that we try to get the information up as quickly as possible, and now we're trying to put it in a, a format that makes sense and that's easy to find the topic that you're concerned about. So also, if you want more information, in the back of the room, there are brochures. We have uh, those chapter conference call flyers. We've got a couple awesome buttons uh, that say Secular Values Voter, and they are free. And then we also have free uh, window clings that go on the inside of your car that also say Secular Values Voter. Um, so check those out on your way out. Um, and we've got about 20 minutes left, and I'll open the floor for any questions. I appreciate your moderation. Oh. I've, I've encountered people, and you are an activist, so you're not going to acknowledge the absurdities coming from the other direction. Mm -hmm. We could ignore that point for the moment. We really try to be, um, because we do work with everyone, we try uh, to be the diplomats, we, is how we describe ourselves, diplomats of the secular movement. Okay, but the, the point of the matter is, if a politician is elected, and he's speaking from his heart, speaking of God and whatever it is that he wants to, I mean, I'm an atheist, I believe people have the right to be stupid, you know, and it doesn't bother me that they're stupid. But what would you do? Would you try to silence him? Would you suddenly shut him off, cut off his microphone? I mean, what would be your thing to, to keep a politician from expressing his own personal position? Well, I would say inform them. Um, actively let them know that they're violating the law. And Wait a minute. You mean a politician, speaking of God, like, mm -hmm. like uh, Rubio did, mm -hmm. you know, from his position, that's a violation of a law? Oh, I thought you were talking about when they were acting in their act in their official capacities. Well, their, their official capacities to advocate laws and things like that. So if they're before the Congress or whatever and making their speeches, mm -hmm. they're they're allowed to say anything they want. 
Um, but we just draw a distinction between official capacity, such as um, active, like holding actual Senate session or House sessions, um, as opposed to speaking at an event. And what I would say to them is when you're acting in the official capacity, when you're speaking on the floor, um, you cannot uh, endorse God. When you're speaking at an event, you should not, because we are, there are 50 million people who have no religious affiliation, who are nuns, and they vote. And uh, you have to, we want them to know that we're here and that we're a much larger voting constituency than they think we are, and that what's gonna change their minds is when we start voting more and we start putting them out of office for these type of things. So, so if a politician can't speak of God in his own capacity before the... Not if he wants our vote. Well, yeah, that's, that's the point. We can get him out with, if we don't vote, but we'll sit down with somebody else. <laughs> thank you. We disagree with each other. Okay. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, just as many people refer to the United States as a Christian nation, I also almost exclusively hear the United States referred to as a democracy. And just like God is not in the Constitution, neither is democracy. Mm -hmm. And given that we're not in the majority, is that a, dis a distinction that's important to you uh, in your efforts? Um, I would say, personally, I believe we're a constitutional republic. Um, so it is important. <laughs> Yay, being informed about correct history. Um, yeah, it is very important because if we operate under this idea that the majority gets what the majority wants, um, well, our, our civil rights, um, the Civil Rights Act and our protections against discrimination and those things that really make us uh, a progressive society go right out the window. I was very curious about the, the subject that you addressed re regarding uh, tax incentives for religious organizations. And mm -hmm. while I'm definitely on board with uh, spending that money in, in education and other places, uh, I, I'm i somewhat worried that, uh, and your organization, not alone, individuals are, are advocating, you know, like we need to take that money and put it, put it somewhere else. And it seems like everybody's saying categorically we need to take all of it. Like all of it needs to go mm -hmm. away and we need to do something else. And I, I'm hesitant about that because while I'm, I'm a staunch atheist and I do not believe that religion overall is a positive thing, I will acknowledge that on a, on a local level, churches do do good things for their communities. You know, they, they set up consignment shops to help mm -hmm. people who are in poverty. They set Absolutely. up soup kitchens, all that sort of thing. So is, is, there a, is there a balance between saying, take all of it away and let them keep all of it, where we can say, you know, like, here's a criteria that you have to meet. Yeah. You know, like, you need to be doing this and that. Like, is that SCA's policy? Um, I would say that you're correct. There are, I believe, five different areas that we do provide uh, these tax exemptions for. Uh, the one that the SEA is is our, our peak concern is what's known as the parsonage exemption. And this exempts ministers specifically um, from paying property taxes on their housing or taxes on money that they receive to pay for housing out of, um, out of uh, their salary. So that, we say, that clearly has no community, but that's not going to soup kitchens or um, you know, community building work. And on that, we um, did have a meeting with the Office of uh, Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships uh, just last week. And in that discussion, um, we said, when you're working with religious organizations, um, they have to use this money you give them in a completely secular way. And I expected a little hesitation or pullback, and um, the... Uh, representative we were meeting with was was on board he what they're trying to do is get these organizations to set up separate entities from the church to be their um, their nonprofit community service side of it and that's something that um, I we haven't brought up in conversation uh, in the office yet but I would think that would be something that we would we would be much happier with um, and as long as, again, that nonprofit that they set up is not promoting religion. 
thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for doing this panel. You know, very good. Um, and I guess one of the major issues I see with this whole situation is the media, because mm -hmm. we have a huge swath of the country just living on Planet Fox, just accepting as gospel whatever Hannity or O'Reilly or Huckabee says, or what their guests say. And on the other hand, we have CNN with the view from nowhere saying, oh, this, these guys have all their science on the side, but these guys say the devil put dinosaur bones in the ground to trick us. I guess it's somewhere in the middle. Um, so my question is, what should really be the solution to this? Should we start making our own um, independent news sources, or should we put pressure on existing news sources, not Fox, because we're never gonna, that's never gonna happen, um, CNN or MSNBC, to really put very um, uh, more logical and uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion on the air. Uh, Chris Hayes is a good star, Rachel Maddow, um, so yeah. Yeah, that's um, an incredibly relevant question, thank you. Um, it's one that would be uh, best answered by our communications manager. <laughs> um, however, I think what you're saying is that there's um, bias and then that there's this idea that being giving giving it the same to both sides is somehow not biased now that that's that neutrality is what's objective as long as we f treat each side um, give them the same amount of uh, press time that that that's what's uh, objective when um, and I believe that that's a fairly recent development in journalism like recent as in co last couple of uh, you know 20 or 30 years but um, we have a really amazing network of online information. Um, and the, the online community and is just such a great place. And um, we really should, I, I agree that we need to figure out a way to make that more accessible uh, to the mainstream and, and try to get it in to be a... Um, we're working on getting into newspapers more, but we do need to get on television more, I believe. But thank okay. you for the question. Thank you. Uh, going back to the symbolic actions, you're probably aware of the ACLU case out of North Carolina, uh, where the, uh, the ACLU sued the Forsyth County Commissioners for opening their sessions with the Christian prayer. Mm -hmm. Although I think everybody agrees you could have them on a size. That was appealed to the Fourth Circuit, which denied the appeal earlier in the spring. Uh, I mean, we could talk about that more, but if I recall, though, I mean, Congress, the House and the Senate have chaplains. They open their mm -hmm. sessions with prayers. Uh, there was a case out of California, I think, a couple of years ago about the money, which didn't go anywhere. But, but uh, could you talk a little bit about that, about, you know, why you can't do it at the, you know, the local level, but you mm -hmm. can do it at the congressional level? Absolutely. Um, part of what I came upon when I was um, doing my research at the Library of Congress uh, I was trying to find exactly where the Supreme Court found the authority for why Congress can have uh, an opening prayer. U.S. Congress is allowed to have an opening prayer. Um, I did find it. It took a lot of digging because there was one line from the record um, one time where they decided by a very slim margin that they were going to keep the chaplain they had on the payroll. Um, so one page out of hundreds, and the Supreme Court found that that meant they did not think opening the federal Congress with a prayer was a violation of the First Amendment. Luckily, that has not been expanded to apply to states or on the local level. Um, different uh, circuits handle it differently. The fourth is a particularly unfriendly one to our positions, um, but the standard as it is is that you cannot have sectarian prayers, so you can't um, reference Jesus Christ, 
but so far you have been, you are allowed to reference God, and um, they, the way they're moving is, which I don't see why this is much better, rather than the legislators saying it, they're bringing in um, uh, reverends and priests to, to do the opening prayer instead. Um, this is just another building block that people can point to and say, look, we're, you know, we're a religious nation or we're a Christian nation um, and our government operates in that way. So it's there's bad case law that we have to fight against there. So uh, we have to also try to appeal to the legislators and on a different level. Uh, when did Congress take that action to keep the chaplain on the payroll? Uh, the case was called Mars, uh, Marsh v. Chambers and it was, I believe, in 1853. So <laughs> it was a long time ago. Hello. I'm a Christian. Okay. And um, when I came here to the convention, um, I was going up the elevator the second day. Um, well, actually, I got here on Thursday. So Friday morning, I'm going on the elevator. And I see this girl in a cow outfit post this sign in the elevator that has Chick-fil-A on it. And it says, all Christians hate fags. And she was homosexual and she was putting it up as if Christians had put that up. And I tore it down, and I told her, if I see you put up another one, I'm going to have you thrown out of the hotel. And I thought that it was a hate crime, that it came under the Hate Crime Act, but actually it doesn't, because it's still covered under freedom of speech. Uh, only assault is part of the Hate Crime Act. But um, with the congressman, that's still covered under freedom of speech. They can still speak how they feel, what their faith is, even from the floor. Um, right. And the um, and another th reason that it made me really pissed off was that here, I've been a science fiction fan all my life. I am a lifelong geek and proud of it. <laughs> and, Science fiction fans, just like my sister is a big Star Trek geek, and the philosophy of Idic from Star Trek, of infinite diversity and infinite combinations, means tolerance of everything and everybody's beliefs and faiths and lifestyles. And that irked me also that, you know, that this was showed its ugly head up at a science fiction convention. Mm -hmm. um, now, I wanted to point out something else was uh, on the Pledge of Allegiance, um, the federal government uh, voted, made law years ago that no child is forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance at all. They can just sit in their chair and not say it. So to say that the ple that children are forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance where it's, and also say under God, they are not under federal law. Okay. Um, Yes. Hold on, I can respond to this. Uh, on the Pledge of Allegiance, um, one small note, uh, the teachers are required to. Um, as a teacher, I found that um, one of the reasons that I did not want to continue being a teacher, um, because I was required to say it, to teach it to my students, and to lead them in it. So as a teacher, I, I did have to say it. Um, but that's up, you need to take that up with your individual school system because in the school systems I am in. Ma'am, I, I, I want to respond to your whole question and we're running short on time and I want to make sure I get to everything. Um, the pledge issue is one of um, both law and enforcement, and different schools do have uh, different rules. The laws that say um, the pledge has to be spoken. Does, they do not all say every student must speak it. Um, some do, but they do not all say that. They What they do say is the pledge has to be recited every day. What's happening when the student is free to not speak it is they are then forced to be a martyr. They're forced to stand out uh, at a time in their lives where all you want is to fit in. And they have to basically be, um, they, they, kids are going to ask them, why don't you love America? 
because you won't say this. And um, it's, <laughs> thank you. I have no problem with the students saying Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, building a uh, pluralistic society and teaching our students uh, about American history and, and patriotism is something that um, is a very important, civic education is a very important part of schools. And if those words weren't in it, then I would have no objection to it. Like I said, that's up to, you know, the voters that need to let your voice be heard on that sort of thing. But I'm saying that's what, and that's what we're trying to do by, by meeting with our legislators if, and if talk the to them. That's what we're trying to do. If obeying the federal law, then that needs to come out. Mm -hmm. Um, and as to your other comments, um, again, we're, we really, as the SCA, the group I'm with, we try to work with everyone. And um, the, the title of the speech, Ignorance Becomes Intolerance, is intolerance is, is something that we're trying to work against by spreading information and truth and facts. And I, I would never support intolerance and uh, on these state conference calls I've been holding, uh, I have had a um, people who are uh, of different religious beliefs uh, on both sides being against what we're doing, but also being very supportive of what we're doing um, because they remember a time when their belief or their faith wasn't the most popular or the majority belief. And um, a lot of these laws were created to protect um, some Christianity-based religions um, when they were originally around. So remembering those protections today and, and tolerance is, is something that uh, I think is really important. No, I just, I just want people to, I talk to people, have people come up to me all the time and say, you Christians. Yeah, just I, I would love to talk to you afterwards, okay. but that we only have about two and a half minutes left. Thank right. you. Well, my question you can answer yes or no, but there is something I do want to bring up. We do have our little victories, um, and I hope everybody lets their legislators know about this. House Bill 2721 in the state of Oregon removed the defense of faith when your children are sick. I found, I found that information at secular.org. And my question is, are you going to the DNC next week? Um, we are sending uh, no, a are representative. Me, to... personally, man, I wish I could. <laughs> um, me, personally, no. Okay, um, well, maybe next year. We're going to have a little meet and greet with uh, David Silverman afterward with uh, Charlotte Atheists and Agnostics. So uh, anybody up at the DNC, go on the CAA website, see what you can find out about it. Uh, we're sending the chair of our advisory board, Woody Kaplan, so okay. I will let him know about that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yay, celebrate hey, the victories. Fellow Flore or former Floridian, so... Um, <laughs> The thing that you See, said, like, the state level is like, you know, there are like things are being passed. Uh, and while like, you know, state level laws are, you know, some of the ones you're passing are just kind of scary. The one thing I, I, you know, you're being a teacher, you're probably all familiar with this, is that a lot of the stuff that takes place in the schools, um, they just, you know, the, the blind eye that gets turned. I mean, I have read of schools that, you know, were sued by like the ACLU and other organizations to get them to do things like, you know, stop forcing prayer in these, not, not allowing, but forcing prayers in these classrooms. And, you know, they would be like, you know, fine, come sue us. And, you know, they would actually pay out like, you know, half a million dollars. And, you know, like, oh, well, our taxpayers who are in for this anyway will pay for it. Um, and the one thing that really bothers me, though, is that, you know, this is a, a whole generation of kids that are being raised to think that science is just another belief. And we're talking about an age when science is probably going to be the most important to everyday people more than ever. Mm -hmm. um, are you all, like, focusing any efforts to try and, like, you know... <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one of the big goals of the state chapters is to try to get into these school board meetings. Um, when I talk about things happening on a state level, um, some of these uh, school board things that they're, where they're changing the curriculum and they're calling things theories um, or putting them in science when they have absolutely no basis in science. They're, they're trying to treat the teaching of a, of a subject as if it were a belief or uh, religion so we are in the process of expanding our support for um, science and reason-based legislation.